Welcome again, everybody. Today we have our third episode of Geostrata Extra. Every issue of Geostrata Extra, which comes out every other month, we take a deep dive into one of the articles with one of the authors and do an extended interview. Thanks for joining us today. If you don't know anything about the Geo Institute, we are a technical society that's part of the American Society of Civil Engineers. We have about 12,000 members. Almost all are geotechnical engineers and geologists. Today is a special day for all of us in the nonprofit community. It is Giving Tuesday. Like all those other nonprofits, we fund a lot of our programs based on the generosity of our members and our donors. We collect money for student participation in our conferences, in our student chapters across the country, in various student activities. If you would like to make a gift, you can do that by going to geoinstitute.org and clicking the big button that says student participation. This year, your gift will be matched by GI past president Ed Cavazangian who is matching gifts up to $125,000 for our 25th anniversary this year. So be sure to take advantage of that doubling. Click that little button that says subscribe outside of the window that you're watching this in, then click get notifications. We will let you know every time we post something new to the channel, which is a lot. Every Wednesday, it's Director's Cut featuring me interviewing GI members. So you're going to want to be around for that. Today, though, Geostrata Extra, we have editor Chris Woods with us of Densification. He's going to be talking with Menzer Pelivan of Jacobs, of Dream Big, of the GI Outreach and Engagement Committee, many reasons to be famous, on her article on inclusion and diversity from the November-December Geostrata issue. Thanks for being with us, Chris and Menzer. And Chris, it's all you. Take it away. Uh, Brad, as, as always, thank you. Uh, good afternoon to uh, to everyone watching, or I guess you know, uh, to the West Coast. Good morning, still. But uh, first, I, I just want to, you know, hope everyone had a, a good and safe Thanksgiving. Um, as Brad said, we're going to continue today with our latest edition of Geostrata Extra with uh, Dr. Menzer Pevelin of Jacobs Engineering. As a champion for diversity and inclusivity causes within the civil engineering. Menzer is with us today to discuss her commentary piece in the November or December 2020 issue of Geostrata that's, you know, devoted to this very topic. Uh, for those that weren't able to catch my interview with Farshid Vahedafard in September, uh, my name is Chris Woods, um, and I'll be the host for this edition. Uh, I've been with the magazine since about 2015. Uh, and now uh, I'm the co-host uh, with the very talented Mary Nodine since uh, the beginning of the uh, these broadcasts this year. Anyway, so a little more about Menzer. Menzer is an award-winning earthquake engineer with Jacobs based in Seattle, Washington, and she is presently the leader for their Northwest Tunnel and Ground Engineering Group. She also serves as an executive advisor to the Vice President of Global Solutions and Technology and is the global co-chair of Jacobs One World Employee Network. Prior to joining Jacobs, Menzer also enjoyed a consulting stop with Muser Rutledge in New York City. Menzer earned her PhD at the University of Texas Austin in 2013, and before that, her master's and bachelor's degrees from the Middle East Technical University in Ankara, Turkey. She's a member of several committees spanning the industry, including presently serving as the founding chair of the Geo Institute Outreach and Engagement Committee, and is also involved in the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, serving as the secretary on the Washington chapter board. Most notably, uh, Menzer was recently uh, also named to the ENR National Top 20 Under 40 for the class of 2020, and she happens to also be the youngest recipient of the ASC President's Medal. Oh, I guess in a, on a more minor note in her free time, uh, Menzer is also a movie star, having played a role in the IMAX movie Dream Big, Engineering Our World. 2020 has really been a year unlike most of us have ever seen. Uh, global pandemics, social justice issues on the forefront, recurring hurricanes this fall, you name it. Um, throughout all this, though, the construction industry, along with many others, has had to move forward amidst much uncertainty. And throughout the uncertainty, one thing is clear, and that it's these issues and challenges have affected absolutely everybody. To that end, 
uh, a topic such as diversity and inclusion comes to the forefront as it too, you know, affects everybody. With that in mind, today we're going to delve into Menzer's thoughts on this topic and on her own her ongoing efforts in the industry to promote diversity and inclusion, or as she would put it, inclusion and diversity. Just a quick reminder, please, you know, as we move forward, send in your questions to the chat feature. We'll try and get to all of them as time allows today. Uh, Menzer, how you doing? How was Thanksgiving? Good. Well, it was different than many of the other Thanksgivings. Stayed safe, but it was quieter. Well, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. And Chris, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I guess let, let's just get right into it. You know, first off, you know, given the subject matter we're going to be talking about here and, and your, you know, seemingly endless involvement in championing, championing inclusion and diversity causes, can you give us a little bit more about your background and perhaps a little bit of insight as to, you know, the experiences that have sort of drawn you toward your involvement in this topic? Yeah, right. Um, I'm not going to take too much time with the background because I think we spend a good enough uh, portion of this call with you explaining my background. But for those who don't know, I'm actually originally from Turkey. So uh, I moved here for to the United States for my PhD, as Chris mentioned, uh, which I completed at the University of Texas at Austin. And I had the opportunity to live in three different parts of the state. So Texas, Austin, New York City, and now in Seattle, Washington. Um, you know, as we move around, so the, I think I'm gonna just like approach it in two different ways. As one of the parts that I'm really passionate about nowadays with inclusion and diversity is the cultural differences and how those impact the way that we work, we communicate, we interact with each other. But the other part that really got me in, Included or like the more passionate about inclusion and diversity was um, my outreach after the opportunity that I had with the outreach after being featured in Dream Big. Uh, when I was growing up in Turkey and when I decided to be a civil engineer, which was driven by an earthquake that happened in 1999, it was a devastating earthquake, but also driven with the fact that I wanted to be one of the decision makers. So I was fortunate enough to grow up with a family that believed that I can do whatever I want to do. So that's what I did believe in too. And I thought that was the case for everyone up until uh, when they were they approached me for Dream Big and I shared them my story. And one of the editors asked me, it's just like, nobody ever told you that you cannot be an engineer or even so civil engineer? I'm like, why? And it was because when you don't think about it, you don't think about it. And I'm like, I started thinking at that very point. Then I realized actually there were like so many different instances, but that I obviously did remember it was in my memory, but I didn't take it to the heart. And that was because of like the support system that I had. What has changed after Dream Big is when I traveled around the States and probably it is more than 50, or like the or even hundred showings in different locations where you get to interact with the general audience, not even engineers. And there are so many people who came to me and said, oh, you know what? I would have been an engineer, but I don't think I could do math. Oh, you know what? Like I actually wanted started studying engineering, but then I decided I'm not good enough. And most of the women, most of them were women. And even in the kids, you would see that instance too. So that is really what made me passionate about it because I know like when you are given the opportunity what changes that can make and the other part is and it's not me just also the research shows when two different minds with different perspectives look at one problem and we, since our basic um, profession is on problem solving you can get with better solutions more optimal more efficient more effective so that is the essence or where my passion for inclusion and diversity stems from. Right, and how and how we got to where we are today. So I guess let's focus a little bit on the commentary, which is you know kind of what brought us together today, your commentary in, in Geostrata. Um, I'm sure there's some viewers maybe haven't had the opportunity to read it yet. Can you, you know, briefly, you know, summarize what it's about? Yeah, um, so I had the opportunity to write as I see it piece. So that is basically, 
my vision for the inclusion and diversity in geo profession. You know, when you when we talk about inclusion and diversity, there are so many layers to it. Some of them that mar that are more obvious and that we talk more so often about are the ones that are visible to eye that we can easily see. But there are also some additional layers that are very crucial to the future of our business and the future of work. And that's what I wanted to focus on. So and those two main topics were the cultural inclusion and diversity and generational inclusion and diversity. So the main piece focuses on that, not to say that race, gender and you know disabilities and so on and so forth are not as important. They are very important, but the particular piece focuses on the ones that maybe we don't really think about daily. Mm, interesting. Um, there's a, you know, the vast number of engineering firms around the country are, you know, maybe 50 employees, annual revenues, less than 10 million, smaller firms. So, you know, one of the first thoughts I had was, as you try and engage and develop these programs in smaller firms where maybe budgetary concerns are an issue, you know, what what can some of the smaller firms, you know, start out to do with with some of these IND practices? Right. I think it all starts with the awareness. It all starts with the awareness of maybe some unconscious biases that we have. Because I don't think hiring a diverse employee and making sure that they are included in the decision process will affect any of the revenue or the uh, operating margin of any of the company. Mm -hmm. So it is just like basically starts with that awareness. And in and, and the part of my, to the, probably the end of my um, article, I talk about that. It is not necessarily a significant investment for the inclusion and diversity. It is creating that culture. And the culture is like really the important point to overcome to unconscious biases. And we all have it. I do have unconscious bias. Chris, you probably have unconscious bias. And it is difficult to sometimes get away from that. And where the cultural inclusion and diversity comes into play is mainly this because our unconscious biases are tend to be formed by the cultures and the backgrounds that we raise in and they have they play a significant importance you might not be able to get rid of all of them but once you start understanding that you might have an unconscious bias then you can choose to act accordingly then realizing that oh that might be my unconscious bias or oh, i see that might be my bias and then you can start changing your perspective or the action around it. So obviously there is some investment that goes into the inclusion and diversity, but I don't really think that that needs to be a significant monetary value. To start with, there are so many now available, if you want to learn about inclusion and diversity, available courses, available sources that are basically free up on the internet and you can learn more about that. It, it can be just like basically putting together a lunch and learn to increase the inclusion uh, understanding of the employees that you have. And really, it starts with one person. It's just like taking the action and rather than being a bystander, you can be an ally. Mm -hmm. And I don't think in any of those that really causes and significant changes in your operating margin on overhead costs, Chris. So there are ways of improving that. Sure. No, that that makes that makes a lot of sense. So let's let's stay on this for a second. I mean, you know, you actually pointed that out in your in your commentary that you know maybe not necessarily forced mandatory trainings or, or things of that nature are are, are that effective. Um, you know, in in your experience, the committee work, your leadership positions with these issues, when you're talking about these unconscious biases is it really just an awareness thing that you feel like is is the most you know beneficial to sort of approach or is there more you know have you noticed like other successful ways to try and raise awareness with that so with the inclusion and diversity trainings it's actually not me saying it it's a harvard business school article that there is a whole study that was research study that was performed around it instead of putting people through the training so what what i observe is when you put mandatory trainings, people who are really interested will get the thing. For the others, it's just like a mandatory thing that they have to sit through, they have to 
spend their time right. on. And you know who I'm talking about in these yep. cases, right? I'm just like, seriously, do I need to do this now? It's like a corporate thing or like a company the thing. The back I, I, I will just like go do my work. So it's not it's not necessarily hitting the point that it needs to hit. What we can do, and I think I need to give the credit a little bit to Scott Brandenburg, who sent me that article, and I think that is very true, is it starts with, you know, mentoring. Why don't you try to mentor someone that looks different than you, that you might have unconscious bias towards because of gender, because of race, because of cultural differences, because of generational differences. When you start to form that relationship with someone who looks different than you or no, it doesn't even have to look different, but somebody who is different than you and who might who you might think that you have bias against. Then when you start forming that relationship, that is the best way of like really stepping out of those boundaries of unconscious biases. And that can be happening in the mentoring. But, you know, not all of our companies are diverse to start with. And but however, we can uh, start that if you are doing a school outreach you know if you're trying hiring it's just like going to the going to do um career fairs or so in those cases you can try to engage with those who might look different than you and give them the chance to learn and this is not just like you mentoring we i think we all this is also part of important it is like a double like the both ways mentoring both ways like it's this is a reverse mentoring too so like you need to be open to that reverse mentoring that you will get from their experience and right. i think that will be the most effective way of creating that now nah, that that that's an excellent point an excellent thought um you know coming back to the commentary one of the skills that you've kind of identified as a key for you know future generational leaders within our industry is going to be understanding and managing of some of these cultural differences, given the ever expanding nature of the global economy. Yeah. So, you know, in your work and experience, you know, what have you seen as effective means for developing this cultural understanding? Is this, um, you know, sort of along the same lines of what we're talking about with the unconscious bias or have there been different um, ways that you've seen of sort of bridging that cultural gap in practice? Right. So being someone from Turkey living in the States and even in the States living in three different locations, as I mentioned, right. when you once you go from South to New York and New York to Seattle, there is a significant cultural change. Absolutely. And in order for you to succeed, you need to understand the cultural differences and also the similarities when you're getting into uh, if you're about to get into an introduction, you need to probably a little bit strategize and understand what cult cultural background they're coming from. And it's just like in the meeting, you need to be strategic about it. If you are if you're aware of these differences and then if you want to succeed, then if things go uh, not as expected, then you need to be able to act on it. So this whole framework, like the four main things, actually the cultural knowledge um and then strategy planning and um i'm missing one of them so like the four of them basically forms what we call cultural intelligence it is similar to emotional intelligence and like you know the iq and eq but it is like kind of a different form it is about that ability to differentiate what is cultural what is personal and like what is like more organizational or general maybe no so that I can I can appreciate what you're saying there. I mean, I'm, you know, myself, I'm a New York, New Jersey kind of guy. But now as a, a contractor that kind of operates on the national stage, you're dealing with contractors in New York City. That's one thing you're dealing with guys in Kentucky or Georgia or Texas. It's it's a totally different, you know, cultural experience. Exactly. So I, I can certainly and, appreciate that. And once you know those differences, then you can prepare for it, right? Mm -hmm. But like if you are going and so I'm just going to give you an example from my end. I'm from Turkey and I'm going to blame it to the Turkish culture that I am impatient, especially when <laughs> communicating. It is very difficult for me to wait until somebody finishes the sentence if I have a, something to say. Right. In some cultures, this might mean to the others that I'm be being very dis disrespectful. Mm -hmm. That is not my intent. Then when I do that, 
some people might see it as, you know, I'm basically uh, being disrespectful. In another culture, if I wait until the end of the sentence and do not talk, that may, they, they might think that I have nothing to say or I basically am not engaged in the conversation. Right. So, and this spans within just like, especially being United States, this can go like, I'm just like describing one New Yorker and like one like a basically Seattleite right now. Absolutely. And it, forget about even coming back from Turkey, but it actually hit me when one of the senior engineers asked me to just like the, uh, we, we were talking and the person was kind of obviously frustrated, but I had no clue why they were frustrated, right? And that goes on like, and you keep talking over people and like it's just <laughs> that was not the way of like basically do not ever do that it is not the way of confronting people and everything i'm just like i'm not trying to disrespect anyone i'm just telling my because if i wait until the end the whole point is gone like it's just like they were about to change the topic then i have to say something that's but it's it. like there are different ways of doing that but, but that's only one of it right the other part is like how you build trust in the States, it is like more than likely you build you build trust when you are working together. Right. Where, whereas if you go to China or if you go to India or Turkey, I, I will give or Italy, people will form like the, their trust if you if you're drinking on the dinner table or like you know if you're having a coffee that is outside of the work that they get to know you. So right. how do you how do you create those, that client relationships also depends on that. And you don't have to work globally for all of these, especially like nowadays with the United States, people are coming from all over different, like all over places. If you can understand where your client is coming from, and this is not just for your employees, right? Like for our clients too, you can form better client relationships. Yeah. Like, so this understanding is essential. And that's why I think the future really depends on the company, like the identifying those people who can, basically understand these cultural differences and strategize and act on them so right. actually for like the major companies like coca-cola and like you know starbucks and everything some of their global um leaders they have to have a cultural they get have to take a cultural intelligence test and like they have to go through this like the major training and that like to just make sure that they are suitable for the markets that they are leading right now that's Good points, man. You know, it's it's interesting when you put it in that perspective that, you know, maybe when people are focusing on diversity, inclusion, the, it, it, it invariably goes to the boss employee, you know, sort of structure. But, you know, I'm, I'm a, personally one of my biggest things in this industry is relationships. And so when you when you touch on it that way, dealing with cultural differences, you know, you could be working for one client, you know, someone's from India, someone's from China, so, you know, all over the place. And and you're right. It's not just the employee um, employer scenario, but also across clients and things like that. So, I mean, it's it's a pretty well taken point, I think. Um, I think one thing to add on that is like within the company, though, especially like I work for Jacobs, we have 52,000. I we right. were just talking right before we started. I take 4.30 a.m. calls with people That's from it. all around the world. It is, I think it's just because if you set on the ground rules of how you're going to communicate and how like that's going to be delivered because this cultural differences have, it's, we, I've only touched on the communication and the trust building, but also there is like the a part where like the time understanding, right? Like for some people late being late for one minute is like a huge issue. The other one, like it's just like 10 minutes late. Oh, that's not an issue at all. So it is like the, that forming these base rules of like how that team is going to work helps solve some of these yeah. uh, misunderstandings that might uh, arise, arise from that cultural differences. No, that's my 17 year old. If he's wired that if 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 he's not 15 minutes early, he's 20 minutes late. So like, yeah, <laughs> I, I understand there are plenty of people that operate like that. Um, Coming back to the commentary for a minute, one of your, you know, one of the topics that you discussed in there was this concept of the generationally diverse management team. And, you know, so that's to say different experience levels represented in within the leadership group. So if we're sticking strictly to geotechnical engineering for the moment, yeah. where, you know, really your success and your decision making process a lot of times is built on the experience 
you've collected over a number of years. Mm -hmm. What does this this concept look like in practice to you? Yeah, right. And that, that's a great question. So there are different hats you can wear in the leadership, right? There is the technical excellence that comes with experience specifically for the geotechnical engineering. But there is there are also different aspects for the company or for the employees that decisions are being made. So if the decisions are only being made by a a small group of people from like the same generation with potentially same type of thinking, then you are basically excluding the rest of it. Even if your company is like very, you know, diverse by gender, by race, it's, it, it applies on every single thing. So like when that decision making table should have voices from different um, generations. And I think this is like, this part is really important and I'm going to be, Critiquing, critiquing a little bit of our industry. Maybe I don't, I don't know if you would agree, but compared to some of the other industries, we might have been a little bit on the um, tail end of catching up with the technology and innovation and like bringing that into geotechnical engineering. And maybe this is the reason why it's just like, oh, because this is the way we've done it and this is how we experience it. But I'm not disvaluing the experience and there is no way that I would do that. But I'm saying that when you bring in other people, maybe they can come up with some more innovative ways and then bring in more innovative thinking into the decisions that you're making. The decision still will be delivered by the, then it will include that experience that is coming from the experienced leader or the engineer right. within the group, but also the new way of thinking that a different generation might be bringing in. And this is for the projects, but also we, we also talk about when we talk about the companies on how we are going to um, improve the culture of the company or how the culture is going to change. So I think that's also another key topic where the generational diversity should be important, because if you do not include that and if you try to roll a company today in 2020 right. with the idea of even 1990s, you are going to lose your employees. And right. I think for you, the market for our industry is really hot. We are trying to keep our engineers and we are trying to keep our people the good people. I don't want to lose them. You don't want to lose them. And if, but if you didn't, if I am providing a more 2020 approach to the work life than mm -hmm. you, they might come and choose me because they want to work that way. So like bringing in that diversity is actually helps. There is a real big business value added to that. Sure. It's with retention and bringing that innovation and different way of thinking, right? You know, like ask somebody asking that question, like, why don't we do it this way? Or like, what about this? Or like bringing in that, like the fresh perspective. I don't think it would hurt. Right. Now, I mean, there's two things you, you said there that stick out to me. And one, I, I don't know how, I don't see how anyone could could accuse the geotechnical uh, field of, of being behind the time. I mean, Every correlation we use is based off the split spoon that was developed, you know, 100, 100 years ago, right? So, yes. I definitely think that you know technology improvements, um, you know, are, are 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 one place where we could always be improving. And I think just inherently, right? I, I kind of look at the relationship, say, between my kid and my mom. Well, my mom's seventy years old, and like having to do something on an iPhone, her eye, like her eyes roll back in her head. You know what I mean? But the seventeen-year-old can, you know, fix it. Like in a, even even my ten year old can work yeah. the iPhone better, <laughs> so there's definitely something to be said for that. And then I, you know, maybe where I was kind of coming with that question in in the beginning was when I'm thinking experience, I was maybe honing in directly on the technical piece of it, right? Yeah. Of of m having done uh, multiple designs and encountering all the failures and and problems that that come up with it. But if I'm hearing what you're saying right, you're really kind of talking not just the technical piece of it, but everything else that goes with leadership and decision making in a firm that helps kind of foster that culture. Yeah, absolutely. That's that is what my goal is or was with, with an article to uh, friends. And even with the technical stuff, I think, um, you know, there are ways of engaging the younger kids. So like the, I shouldn't say kids. I'm uh, can I can I can I be considered one of the kids? <laughs> uh it's like the younger engineers in a sure. way that 
in that decision making, right? Like it is like reaching out to them and like making them a part of decision making that goes into that mentoring and being open to that reverse mentoring when they ask a question, it's just like, oh, why don't we do it this way? I just like learned, maybe they went to school at like this amazing right. university and they there is like this new correlation of doing the, well, I'm an earthquake engineer, so I'm gonna just say like the estimating liquefactions into settlement instead right. of like what was used like 80 years ago. So like there is like that interaction. So not to senior engineer is always a senior engineer, right? And like that experience is invaluable, but there are ways of engaging the mm -hmm. different generations. Yeah, the answer can't always be, well, because I said so. Like I, yeah, yeah no, that, exactly. that, that certainly makes sense. So let's continue on this for a second. So, you know, one of the, the points, right, you were making lateral career growth and things like that that are that are championed by the sort of millennial Gen Z generations that kind of allow for maybe this quicker um, sort of career advancement. As we've been talking about with the experience, again, a lot of the experience, and I'm, I'm coming strictly at the, the geotechnical kind of aspect of this, your experience comes from being on a drill rig, being on a construction site, overseeing pile driving, things like that that are, you know, there's not really a way to accelerate that knowledge base, so to speak, right? It's collected over a period of time. So, um, you know, and, you know, what, what have you seen in terms of this kind of fast tracking potential that, you know, where it's been successful and, and how that's worked out in our industry? Right. So I think that's a great question. The part that you're talking about is the vertical growth, right? Like you start from the way you add the knowledge and add the knowledge. What I'm talking about is like, while you're doing that and like adding the knowledge, Maybe there are other hats that you can wear within the com company that mm -hmm. helps you also work on your leadership skills. Whereas mm -hmm. like, you know, it is not that you are just sitting behind a drill rig, which is basically the initial start of like the geotechnical engineer's yeah. career. So if you guys, if anyone <laughs> watching didn't know that, that's the start. <laughs> exactly. That's where you start. Like that's where it starts. Like let's let's not kid ourselves. Um, but then while you're doing that, maybe in the in a year or three years into your career, you start wearing different hats within the company mm -hmm. or within the organization. So it doesn't have to be your own company as well. But like finding different ways of owning a project, it doesn't have to be a project that is technical, but yet still will help you diversify your knowledge and strengthen your different types of skills that you may need in the future as you become leader within the company right. or like within the industry. And I, that being said, I think one of the things that is possible to do is to make that maybe not the fresh entry level engineer, but like a couple of years experience engineer be the owner of the project or to give the owner of the task under the supervision of the senior engineer. And sometimes maybe in some companies that might not be achievable. Or even in the company, like if there are any uh, initiatives that are going on, try to get them engaged and like give them different responsibilities. It is not necessarily just like take the ent entry engineer and like make them the design lead. That's not definitely not right. what I'm saying. What, what I'm saying is like give them their different opportunities to strengthen their skills so that they can be design leads in a faster uh, portion. Because I there we have so many capable engineers and like I know it has it has been that like, oh, you need to be 10 years of experience before you get that. Right. But it, it also depends on the people. If you have, there there are, I'm gonna, this is like part that I really like. You have rock stars and you have superstars. If you are super, and they're both equally uh, important for a company and like for your group and team to grow. Your rock stars, they're happy with what they're doing. They are happy with gradual growth, but superstars, if you wanna keep them, you need to keep them busy, especially for the new generations. You need to keep giving them some new challenges. And if you expect the superstar to act like a rock star or if you give rock star additional responsibilities that will overwhelm the rock star, you're going to lose both and your team is not going to function. Like the good team functioning is really understanding these two differences and being able to modify your um, demands and like what you're making available for these two different type of people right. so that they can be happy within the company so that you can retain them. No, that I mean... 
I, I think back, right? I mean, now again, I'm, I'm a contractor. We're, you know, small 20 people. It's a, it's an entirely different dynamic than when I was, you know, my former life in the consulting world. But I think back to the, the many roles that I, that I had there, internal workshops, you know, being out on college campuses, recruiting. I mean, let's face it. There's not a lot of people in our industry that like even doing what you and I are doing right now, being on camera and speaking and stuff like that. Right. There, there's a, there's a lot of engineers that want no part of that. They want to be able to focus on just, you know, doing what they're doing. So I, I think there's a lot to what you're saying there in terms of it's not just, you know, boring logs and and earth pressures and doing your design, but it's it's public speaking, it's writing, it's, you know, presenting, you know, a lot of what we do is is marketing, right? right. You're doing marketing and you don't even know you're doing marketing kind of thing. You're out talking in front of people. So um I, I can definitely, you know, appreciate you know what you're saying, what you're saying there. Um I think one thing I can attest to, you know, being um at a higher level of responsibility, you know, being a vice president of a company right now, you know, that higher level of responsibility has some pluses and some minuses to it, right? Mm -hmm. So pluses are, you know, a lot of times I'm able to drive my own schedule, I'm making decisions, um, you know, but at the same time, um, there's issues that come up and as a vice president of a company, it doesn't matter necessarily what I'm doing, where I am, those sorts of things that they need to be dealt with immediately. And that could be a problem on the field. That could be a problem with an employee. It just, there, there's no time. It, it just has to happen. And, you know, right. I, I think to what you're saying here with your role on the on the kind of the global stage within your company, 4.30 calls, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's plenty of times my phone starts ringing at 6 a.m. because I got guys on a site, maybe there's frost or what, what, what do we do? You know, well, you're the boss. You got to tell us what to do kind of thing. Um, you know, my life, my wife loves when that happens, when, when the phone starts ringing at 6 a.m. But these just inherently 4.30 calls, 6 a.m. calls, you know, 9 p.m. You know, I worked on a project in China where I'm on calls at, at 2 a.m. Um, I've been there, too. You're not alone, Chris. Don't feel no, alone. No, <laughs> and, and there's, there's, there's plenty of us that are that are there. Um, that can it, it can kind of diametrically be at odds, though, with this concept of, of work life balance that is is sort of a a notable cause that's championed by the by the millennial generation. So when we're talking about your concepts, you know, at, at accelerated advancement, multi-generational advancement, and you, you kind of get into this like old school versus new school sort of mentality. Um, how do you bridge the gap between, you know, this work-life balance or, you know, what have you seen recently that, you know, might make employee satisfaction, the work-life balance kind of kind of work out, right. but also keep it in the terms of like, well, now you have more responsibility, right? It's it's sometimes they're at odds with each other. Well, actually, this is no like the rocket science and it is not a new concept. So I will tell you, um, I'll just start with one example, Netflix, for example, the, if they have unlimited vacations, so they don't have a 15 day PTO or, or so when, when they start. But when the work is there, the work needs to be get done. So mm. the same thing applies. When work is there, work comes first. Um, but we also need to separate going back to that superstars and the rock stars. Mm -hmm. So you and I, that I don't, I'm not going to talk for you, Chris, but mm -hmm. like it in some weird way energizes me that I need to do that or I get to do that or what right. you're doing. I would put what uh, your permission us in the superstar category because again, rock star or superstar not better. It is just like that person who like wants to go up one not more, one not more, one not more. And then there's the rock stars who are happy doing, let's say, regular their job very well, amazingly well. That like the company really relies on and doing that. It's like eight to five more defined schedules. And so these two should be separated from each other. So like, you know, but work life balance is actually a very important topic in order for you to be able to get the best out of your people, because if they burn out, they start procrastinating, they start postponing, the deadlines flew by. So it is research proven that work life balance is important. One thing I think among the whole the whole year that we went through, I think good that is coming out of it is 
the whole world learned that you don't have to be in the office yep. for the work to get to be get done. For our case, if you are talking about the site, you need to be we we our site drilling projects still continue, our construction projects still continue, and for those you don't have that flexibility, and you need to work around that. Right. But like for the flexibility that I'm going to talk about is when we are doing our focus work, where we are doing it from, how we are doing it. So I've been championing this for for a while, and actually this was an initiative that started within our company before the pandemic that started talking about the future of work. Through the when the pandemic hit, we did have a core working group that worked on identifying the strategy how the future of work, not return to work immediately after the pandemic, which we still do not know when that's going to happen, but yeah. future of work, like where we want to, uh, where we want to go, and. That is really, uh, I've, I've been fortunate enough to be one of the eight that worked in that group, and so I can give some insights. The main thing that we focused on was the culture, the tools, and place. So none of them work if the other two is not there. So we are actually, as a company, we are going into the future of work as a distributed workspace. So nobody will be ha will be having assigned um, working stations within the company so you will have your flexibility to do your focus work wherever you want but of course there are some collaborative work that you would need to do for those that you would need to go back go to the office where the office will be a more interactive space and sure. focus work can be done from anywhere it's just like if you work better in coffee shops which is the case for me i thrive in coffee shops i blame it on my phd that's how i finished my thesis right uh, <laughs> Yeah, I was lucky enough. I was lucky enough to get off the hamster wheel before they sucked me in for my PhD. <laughs> That's a whole other story. Uh, but it is like some people there uh, need different flexibility. So instead of having to be at the eight at the office at eight, if a parent needs to drop their kids between eight and eight thirty to school, assuming that there is no field work or anything that really necessarily requires them to be there, right? Just a regular work schedule, and that's what I'm referring to. Then sure. they can do that, and then they can arrange their work life around their whole, like the actual life, and still deliver the projects. This is exactly what we have been doing for the past nine months, working yeah. remotely in front of this computer. I miss interaction, and I'm my, I'm most more of an extrovert than an introvert, so I miss talking to people and everything, but it still also gives you the flexibility. You eat healthier, your mental health health is, if this was not the case, if it was not a pandemic, and if you were to be able to socialize, probably would be better. Actually, we did run a huge survey within the company where um, 25,000 people take all over, all around the world for that future of work initial. And the one thing that came out loud and clear was people need flexibility. It helps yeah. their, uh, mental mental health, which is very important. It helps their like the the sustain, and it also helps to include increase the diversity and inclusion within the industry because then you will be making it possible for more people to be able to work maybe part time or like even full time when they can adjust to their schedules. Sure. Yeah. Now that it's. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Everyone's kind of spent more time at home with their their families, and and you have more time to talk talk over the last you know eight nine months. And you know, one thing we've definitely talked about is that I, I think coming forward and coming out of this, I I'm not real sure that I would want my job to be tied to like leasing office space, right? <laughs> because okay. I, I I think there's going to be some changes um, from this that we're not going to come back from, and. I don't mean to suggest that in a bad way, but like what, what you're talking about, there's going to be permanent changes that come out of this in terms yes. of flexibility, you know. Yes, and it's not only us, I'm seeing it in our clients too. So like in yeah. Seattle, some of the basically the um, organizations here that are our clients, they're changing it into the full remote working, even the like the entities here, like the counties and the cities. So, you yeah. know, it is not only us and then again it will come back to retention and how you keep the people because right. one if one provides the flexibility and the other one says like you need to be in the office eight to five 
where I mean, I can do this work from anywhere. Why can't I? Yeah, why can't I be Maybe at home? Question. Yeah, I mean, this is personally it's helped me. I mean, I, I I generally work from home a lot anyway. So the one one thing that's good for me is that it's not necessarily weird to have your dogs barking in the back of a Zoom call anymore, right? That's that's pretty yeah, common. So that, that helps me out. Absolutely. So let's shift gears. Um, you know, we have a few minutes left here. I wanted to kind of shift away from from the commentary and talk about couple of the other campaigns and, and things you're involved with within Jacobs um, personally or, you know, with with what's going on this month and it being um, violence against women and international human rights. You know, talk about some of those other things that, that you're involved in here at Jacobs. Well, as as I said, um, I wear several hats. So like going back to that generational diversity and like lateral growth. So I think I'm a good example of that. Um, one of the hats that I'm wearing is I'm the global co-chair of One World Employee Network, and it is very unique to Jacobs. That is a network that really focuses on cultural inclusion and cultural intelligence. The campaign, however, I was running through the November, uh, through the November, uh, was on unite to end violence against women, and this comes with the one point where you know we can be bystanders or we can be allies or we can be the person who like actually like take it into action. And for this one, there was a global uh, social media campaign going on back in July where women all around the world were posting their black and white pictures to raise awareness of the violence, especially increasing in some of the countries, Turkey being one. And actually UN is calling this, um, there has, let me back up, in just in 2009, prior to pandemic, 243 million women and girls were subjected to domestic or sexual violence across the world. And with pandemic, these numbers has increased. You were saying that we are all in the house and how supposed to be the safe place for us for like to be safe from the medical pandemic. For yeah. some, it is not. It's the unsafe place. Yeah. Absolutely. It is. It is not, and that created this shadow pandemic, as the UN puts it. And we wanted to, what we wanted to do is, I think, companies like Jacobs that that are global, and what we want, if we want to compete with the bigger companies and like want to make the change, we need to use our global platform, in a way, to create awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, violence stems from basically imbalance in power and control, which can be treated if we create gender equality. And it just like ties back to what we're talking about, inclusion and diversity. So, and then like creating that equality, creating that financial freedom for any gender, but like mainly women and girls. So the whole campaign was focused around that uniting the unite to end violence against women. November 25th was the International Day for Eliminating Violence Against women and between November 25th and December 10th which and today is like December 1st so we are still in there UN runs 16 days of activism December 10th is by the way international day for human rights international human rights day yeah so and then for, through the 16 days uh, they are trying to raise awareness about this very issue what we've seen when we were running this in the whole Company. And we did talk about the global pandemic. We did talk about how to deal with trauma and how what the res what resources available, what how different cultures um, treat this issue differently. And mm -hmm. just to say no culture or ethnical background can be an excuse or an explanation for violence. But right. sometimes you see that that can be used and how what can be the change. And we did even have the CEO of employers. Um, initiative on domestic abuse uh, as join one of our calls. But like what we try to do is together, if we start talking about this issue, we can start to recognize, then we can respond and we can refer. And we can just re really take this initial step to be a resource for someone. I'm going to be very honest, Chris. I When I started this and um, I'm one of the lucky 30% that haven't experienced that because one in three women had statistically experiences that. And mm -hmm. when we had courageous conversations where people were 
a lot or like encouraged to share their own stories. When you start hearing the, the stories of your colleagues, the people that you work with, that puts in a different perspective. And yeah. sometimes you don't think if you, if you see the signs, if something is different, it just starts with like, you know, take that five minutes within your meetings to ask someone how they really are and listen how yeah. they like how they respond to that like the answer and if it's if the response is not that good just follow up that's just yeah. that simple and it starts with that so i'm very proud of like how the campaign turned around and we actually started a global matching campaign i know this is giving tuesday so we are jacobs is matching 100 percent of the funds that employers employees um donate to that basically helping campaigns around the globe uh, that supports the violent and violence against women. So, no, oh, that's I mean that's outstanding stuff. And and you're right. I mean it's it's you know one thing you got the TV on kind of in the background while you're cooking dinner and it, you, you hear statistics or you hear a story, but when it becomes your colleague or your coworker or your fan, like it just these sorts of topics take on a completely different meaning when it's when it's something that touches you. And I think one thing that I want to add for pick and for that gender equality for us, our or our business being mainly male dominated, especially leadership. I think it's very important for our male leaders to get into the idea of male allyship and like becoming an ally for women to like really drive that gender equality is like key to really solving so many of these issues no that's that's a, a good point um we got a few minutes left here we had one question come in i wanted to get to from one of our, our viewers uh the question is do you advise the geo professionals who work abroad to know the other's culture or being the same as another's culture and can anyone succeed by doing only your work aside from that culture i mean I, you know i interpret this to mean like can you just go to another place and just put your head down and do your work and be successful? Or, or do you recommend, you know, well, being able if, to immerse in that? If you're moving or so, you know, there is no way that you can know every culture. You just, it is the end. I think that goes back to the cultural intelligence. It starts with your curiosity to learn about different cultures, but you cannot know everything about it. But if you're going to work abroad and live abroad, I would 100% recommend to learn what that culture is like unless you're gonna be in the cave and like not interacting with anyone and just like basically scratching numbers and like doing the calculations and design and not interacting with anyone no relationships then probably it's not an important part of your business but if there are any relationships whether it is it is with your colleagues from that culture whether it is with your clients or even socially like to understand like in the social settings for your social life i think it's very important to understand what that culture is like not to say that you need to change your culture but you can adjust or you can ex your you can adjust your expectations and right. you know you can then differentiate if like what is personal what is cultural when the when you're interacting with others i like to give this example so for example it's just like chris if I see a grasshopper, that's an insect for me, but right. it can be an appetizer in Thailand. And that's right. just culture. Right. Let's so just before we kick it back over to Brad, um, one other one last thing I wanted to touch base here with you on is, you know, you're no stranger to the Geo Institute YouTube feed. Um, you know, you're involved with the the inclusion and diversity live series that you're running, uh, you know, as the host. And I know you've had, you know, Jean-Louis Briard and Amber Spears, and I, I just watched the, the interview you did with uh, Suzanne Lacoste the other day. Um, just take a minute or two real quick and, and kind of talk about, you know, how this series developed and, you know, where it's going. Right. Uh, so thank you for reminding me that. It was nice to be the guest for a change, <laughs> <laughs> to say. <laughs> No, uh, those, I really enjoy the inclusion and diversity series, live series uh, we have. The idea started with um, really talking with a diverse group of engineers, within geo, geo professionals, I should say, within our industry, and to get their own experiences and their takes for 
what that inclusion and diversity is, what needs to be done in the geo profession, what has been done, and like what are the things that they think are missing or they need it needs to be addressed. It is usually a candid conversation to hear. I really did enjoy talking with John Louis, and like we talked, to, he's the incoming president, or he's now the president. Of right. ASC. At the time, he was the incoming. Um, but Amber, we did talk about the, you know, the racial diversity and inclusion, and like what and what can we do in the geo profession because we are not that we are definitely not very uh, racially diverse to attract more of the younger engineers to within sure. our profession. Uh, with Suzanne, we talked about her experiences, just like she's a geo legend to start with. And like right. so many women I know looks up to Suzanne and like right. hearing her experiences and her take, I think was valuable. So like it is more of like a candid conversation to hear about what other people think about uh, inclusion and diversity and what we can do in the geotechnical profession. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I think we're we're just about at, at our at our hour, so I want to bring Brad in. But before I do that, I just I've really enjoyed this. I, I think this has been a great conversation. You know, hopefully, uh, some of the engineers in our field that are out there watching this, you know, are able to you know take away some something from from all the insight you've you've shared today. So I I just I thank you again for for participating and, and being part of this. Thanks for hosting, Chris. This was really Absolutely. fun. Absolutely. All right, Brad. And thanks to both of you guys for doing a great job today. I always feel like I should have a plaque or something to <laughs> give to you guys at the end of one of these episodes, unfortunately. Well, I, I don't know, Chris, I'm what, like 25 miles away from you. I could run it over you can, real yeah, quick. You can bring one <laughs> Menzer will America. just be out of luck because she's, uh, she's on the other you side of the country. You can bring here too, Chris, like Brad. Like, why not? Yeah, it'll go a little Forrest Gump. It might take a month or two, but <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but this was fantastic, guys. And to, to all the viewers, thank you for spending your lunch with us to hear about this important topic. If it was interesting to you, and I think it probably was because you sat through it, check out the rest of the November-December issue of Geostrata. There's a lot more interesting articles in there on diversity and inclusion. And then, of course, come back to check out Menzer's Diversity and Inclusion live series. The next one's going to be on December 15th with Scott Brandenburg of UCLA, who is their dean of diversity. That's going to be a great conversation. So mark your calendars for that one. Um, remember again, Giving Tuesday, head over to geoinstitute.org. You can contribute to our student programs. Make sure that the next generation of geotechnical engineers is well supported. Subscribe to our channel. A lot of good stuff up here. Director's Cut comes out tomorrow, every Wednesday. You'll want to see those. And be on the lookout for the Terzaghi Lecture, the 2021 Ed Cording that we recorded in Minneapolis earlier this year. That's going to get posted this month as well. So thanks again for joining us. And thanks again, Chris and Menzer, for being a great host and a great guest. And we will see you soon. All right. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, Brad. Thanks, Chris.